But what we're going to talk about today, and this is going to kind of be a refresher for some of you, um, and for others, if you're, if you're new to this body, I just want to cover some of the basics. What we're going to talk about is what we believe, what we believe, and why. Now, it is very easy for you to go to either our website or uh, the rhema.org website, and you can you know, see the, the tenets of our belief, you know, like um, just here on the website. Of course, the scriptures are the word of God. Absolutely. The Godhead. We, we all believe in the Godhead. Uh, man fell, we have eternal life and new birth, water baptism, baptism of the Spirit. We believe all of that. But what I want to talk about today is what we believe that helps us get through life tactically. You know, by, you know what I mean by that? What is going to help me in the moment? How do I put feet to my faith? So we're going to look at what we believe and why. Now, one of the things that we believe, and you see it everywhere. Let me show the next slide, please. We, you, you see it on everything that we produce. Jesus is. Jesus is. So we're going to talk today about some things that Jesus actually is to this body of believers, things that are important to this body of believers. Let's start in the book of Isaiah. So we're going to do two scriptures, Isaiah and Matthew. And they're pretty much the same scripture. Isaiah 7.14 says, Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and he shall call and, and shall call his name Emmanuel. God with us, yes. Matthew one twenty three, Behold, the virgin shall be with child and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which is translated God with us. God, or God became one of us. Emmanuel is a term used for the new creation life coming down out of heaven. So Jesus is. What's the first thing that Jesus is that, that is important to us on our day-to-day -day lives? In short, Jesus is God incarnate. Jesus is God in the flesh. Jesus is heaven touching earth. So why is that so important? The reason that is so important, this very same Jesus who is God incarnate, is by the scriptures that we uh, deemed to be infallible called the last Adam. The first man Adam, the living spirit, living being, the last Adam is a life-giving spirit. The reason the scriptures make that comparison is because this earth was given to Adam. Who then gave it away to somebody else. And we needed another Adam, the last Adam, to come and get dominion of it back. Okay? And the only one worthy to do it is God himself. The reason that is so important is because if he didn't think you were worth it, he wouldn't have come. At which point, he would have had to destroy us. How would he destroy us? Simply cut his presence off. Right? What is, what is hell? What is the, 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 everyone who goes to hell and comes back, and you can, you can look over YouTube and see, it, what is one of the, the most um, apparent characteristics of it? Is, Yes, and each and every one says there was a complete and utter separation from God. That is hell. Yes, the fire and the, and, the, and the worm that never dies, all the pain is, but there is complete and utter separation from God. Very important, because you and I were deemed worth it, so much so that the holy God 
put on flesh and walked among. And that is unique out of all the quote unquote religions of the world. As a matter of fact, other religions look at us as heretics for even for even thinking that. But God says, you know what? I created this thing that has a mind, will, and emotion. It is a spirit and lives in a body. I created this thing, and that thing I deem to be worthy to house me. So I'm going to go and live among them and show them how to live a life that is not, a, that is not stained with sin, but has been anointed with my spirit. And that's what Jesus came to do. Jesus is God incarnate. Go with me to Romans 10.1. Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they may be saved. For I bear them witness that they have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. That's interesting. For they being ignorant of God's righteousness and seeking to establish their own righteousness, have not submitted to the righteousness of God, for Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. For Christ is the end. So look at that in the Passion, uh, in the Passion Translation. He says, for the Christ is the end. The Christ is the end of the law, and because of him, God has transferred his perfect righteousness to all who believe. You know, through Israel, one of the things God was showing mankind is what was lost. And that there was going to be a cost to getting it back. Uh, E.W. Kenyon, uh, we've done his Bible study course. One of the ways he described what Adam did was high treason. Okay? Through Israel, he's showing us, for I bear them witness, that they have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge, for they being ignorant of God's righteousness, seeking to establish their own righteousness, have not submitted to the righteousness of God. Through Israel, he's showing us what we lost, okay? So wh what is the next Jesus? So Jesus is God incarnate, okay? Show the next one. Jesus is our reconciler, our justifier, our righteousness, and our connection to life. That's what Jesus is. Jesus in John 10, 10 says, I have come that you might have a whole bunch of rules and regulations and have them more abundantly. <laughs> Jesus said, no, I have come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. Now, Jesus, John 1, 1 says, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God. We, we go over that every week. What is the Word? The Word is, think of the Word this way. The Word is the totality of God's thought about everything. And that totality of thought put on flesh. and walked. In. It had the totality of God's wisdom wrapped up in flesh. Yes, there were certain things that were not given to Jesus, like the time of his return. Because right? he even told the disciples, hey, those are in the Father's domain. I don't even have access to it. But with respect to everything about humanity and how humanity works, with respect to everything about the earth and how the earth works, with respect to everything about you and your destiny, it took on flesh and dwelt among you. It just, it, I'm sorry, it reconciled you, reconciled you to God. It justified you in God's eyes and then gave you God's righteousness and then became our connection to life. Why is that so important? Why is, so the connection to life, what is life? According to John 17, life, that's, that's Zoe life. According to John 17, what did Jesus say? This is eternal life. To know, to know the Father, right? Jesus is our connection to the Father. Nobody's looking excited about that. 
Why is that important? Okay, fine. Go ahead and try to live life without it. Yeah, most of you have tried, haven't you? <laughs> See, what Jesus did, Jesus in the Godhead saw mankind in the muck and the mire that was our existence with no connection to the Father. And Jesus says, okay, uh, um, before he was Jesus, he's the word, he understands, okay, okay, I'm going to go there. I'm going to be brutally murdered. I'm going to have to, okay, do you realize that before the word became flesh, he never had to take a bath. Okay, you guys laughing. He never, he never had to drink water. He, he just was. He just existed without the need for anything. And to go from that without the need of anything to having to require sleep. And not only that, he came as a little baby, which meant which meant when Mary messed up, he couldn't say, you're doing it wrong. Because he was a baby. This diaper rash is because you didn't change me in time. <laughs> he was a baby. He went from not needing anything to being dependent upon two human beings. Why? For you. For me. I, you see, I don't think we, we truly I'm, I'm going to make an uh, analogy which will fall apart. All analogies fall apart at some point, except the ones that Jesus did. I'm going to make an anal analogy. would be like Bill Gates leaving his mega mansion and going to live in, uh, uh, was a, was a, where's a bad hood? Let's say the fifth ward in, the fifth ward in New Orleans, right? Or, or, or live in Tent City. And the reason I say that falls down because where Jesus was is far better. Is far better than Bill Gates' mansion. And coming to become a man from that is far lower than moving to the hood. So it, again, it, it doesn't display the magnitude of what Jesus did in taking on flesh. Just for you and for me. In that process reconciled us, justified us, gave us his very own righteousness and pointed that out through highlighting Israel so they're going about to seek the, to establish their own righteousness and not the righteousness of God and then created a connection or became the connection so that you and I could actually touch the Father again. Not only touched, but be touched by the Father again. Well, at least for me, that's exciting. Okay. Let's look at something else Jesus is. 1 Peter 2.22 Who committed no sin, nor was deceit found in his mouth. Now you see, that's 1 Peter 2.22, but that's also Isaiah 53.9, for those who don't know. Next verse, who when he was reviled, did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but committed himself to him who judges righteously. Who is him who judges righteously? The Father. Okay, thank you. I'm just making sure you're awake. Who himself bore our sins in his own body, on the tree, that we having died to sins might live for righteousness, by whose stripes you were healed. Okay. This one passage of scripture. Who himself bore our sins. So if, if he bore your sins, why are you still trying to bear them? Right? Okay. Next slide. Jesus is 
in all ways our substitution. Which is to mean, which is to say, there is nothing that you can do which he didn't pay for. You don't believe that? There is nothing that you can't, okay. There's nothing that you've done in the past. Nothing you're currently doing right now, thinking you wish I would shut up. And nothing you will ever do in the future that Jesus Christ, as his substitutionary sacrifice, didn't pay for. Nothing. And one of the keys to, to that, to, oh, I'm sorry, the key way I remember that is this. If Jesus didn't do it, you won't be able to. If Jesus didn't do it, you can't. With respect to everything that Jesus is, with respect to being our reconciler, being our righteousness, to being our substitution, if he didn't do it, you out of luck. <laughs> you know, one of the things I, I, I love, I, I'm, I'm a word geek, so I try to look up every Greek word and every Hebrew word. What I found is, is in that uh, verse, uh, in verse 24, as I'm looking up the word healed, I found this in the Theological Dictionary of New Testament, uh, of New Testament words. It says this, in early times, only physical ailment that can be understood is a wound in battle. Sicknesses that are not understood, we thus uh, are thus seen as attacks by alien powers which can be overcome through sacrifice or magic. And that's, that's one of the, in the Theological Dictionary of New Testament words, what I got out of that is any sickness, any disease, is an attack by some other entity. Okay, maybe, maybe you didn't get that, okay. God the Father isn't punishing you with sickness and disease. God the Father is not punishing you, your family member. God didn't give my mom cancer. Wouldn't I almost be schizophrenic? Right? So Jesus came to bear all of that, but God the Father is pouring it out on people. Wouldn't that, that'd be, that would be, wouldn't that be like a house divided against itself? So you can with full assurity be confident in knowing that if it is in your life and it came to steal, to kill, and destroy, you know who it came from. And if you know who it came from, it not being God, you know that there's an answer for it. Because Jesus is. Just that, that proclaiming Jesus just speaks so much to my spirit, and I hope it speaks the same to you. Because that not only is something that we're doing externally, but that's something we're doing internally. Proclaiming Jesus is. How many of you ever wake up in the morning and have a pain in your body? Listen, this is not a confession. I'm not, okay, I'm not asking you to confess him. But how many of you ever wake up and have a pain in your body? Okay. What do you do? Based on what? Okay. Because what I do immediately when uh, some you know, knee may start hurting or uh, the joint in a toe starts hurting, I don't care how small the pain, attack it immediately. Immediately. There are 59 steps to get to our condo. Right? So I have to walk down 59 steps and up 59 steps. If I walk out the door and my toe hurts, that's 59 steps I'm going to be reciting Isaiah 53. Amen. He was wounded for my transgressions, bruised for my iniquity, chastised me all the way down, and generally by the time I get to the bottom, it doesn't hurt. I step out of my car and it hurt, 
59 steps up. He was wounded for my transgressions, bruised for my nicks, all the way up. Why? Because Jesus was my substitute. And so, how many, how many of you here believe that Jesus is happy with your experience in what he's paid for, for you? And let me tell you, I don't believe he's happy with my experience. Because I am not walking in the fullness of what he paid for. And I understand that it's not a confession, but I am walking toward it. I am walking toward it. And my goal is to make sure that each and every one of you is walking toward it constantly. We have so many ministries to do. I mean, he gave pastors and preachers and teachers and apostles for the purpose of training the saints for the work of the ministry. Okay? The work of the ministry is sometimes external and sometimes internal. Okay? And the more of the work you do internally, I believe the more of a confidence it will give you to do it externally. I, I've never met anybody who's got a pain that, that I'm afraid to pay, pray for. Let's look at something else that Jesus is. I promise there's a point it'll all be tied up together. Go with me to 2 Corinthians 1.19. Corinthians, to me, is such a good book. Why is it a good book? Because... If ever there was a debaucherous society in the world, it would have been the Corinthians. Corinth was the Vegas of the day. What happens in Corinth stays in Corinth. <laughs> and God took out time to write two letters to them. To me, that's encouraging. There may be someone watching, because I know everyone in this building is holy and sanctified and just in all things. <laughs> but there may be someone watching who, who is not feeling so holy and just and thinking because I've messed up, God is no longer speaking to me. And let me tell you, if you can squeeze in. <laughs> It doesn't matter what you've done. The Lord still loves you and will speak to you. As a young Navy lieutenant, I did something really stupid. I went to a bar to get drunk because I had a problem. And the Lord, after I got drunk, sat on the bar stool next to me and says, now what? You still have to go work and find go to work and find all of that top secret material that you've lost. So go home, go to sleep, and get up in the morning and go find it. Traditional thing it says because I was at a bar drinking that the Lord wouldn't talk to me. I'm telling you, he did. Okay? <laughs> and I, I definitely remember it. I definitely Remember it. Anybody ever been drunk and the Lord talked to you? I'm just saying. It just. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Oh, no, no, no. See, that, that, that don't count. That don't count. No, I am not saying go and drink. Is there biblical precedence for someone having done something bad and the Lord talking to them? The first murder on the planet and the Lord talked to him. See, the Lord is not afraid of what you've done at all. And believe it or not, he's actually trying to get you not to do it knowing that you're probably going to do it. And even when you do it, he's not going to leave you. Because Jesus said, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. Okay? All right. 
We're going to go back to, I don't know how we got there, but we're going to go back to 2 Corinthians 119. For the Son of God, Jesus Christ, who was preached among you by us, by me, Sylvanius and Timothy, was not yes and no, but in him was yes. For all the promises of God in him are yes, and in him an amen to the glory of God through us. Now he who established us with you in Christ and has anointed us is God, who also has sealed us and given us the Spirit in our hearts as a guarantee. Jesus is the yes and amen to all God has for us. Why is that so important? You know, in the Old Testament, you always see the scripture that says, if you will do thus and so, the Lord will do thus and so. Right? Jesus took care of the thus and so. That's how you can say all the promises are yes and amen. Why? Because he earned them and gave them to you. Gave them to me. So that you don't, as a matter of fact, you look stupid trying to earn them. Just be. Just exist. And what's worse is you look stupid trying to make someone else earn them. We're going to do one more Jesus is. One more Jesus is. We're going to do this out of Jeremiah 31. We're going to start in verse 33. Verse 33 is very long, so I had to break it up. But this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days says the Lord. Now, verse, 30, verse 31 and 32 says this, Behold, the day is coming, says the Lord, when I will make a covenant with the house of Israel. The reason I want to point that out is because in the context, Jeremiah is talking to the house of Israel. Prophetically, he's talking to the church. Why? Is the house of Israel a descendant of Abraham? A new covenant will I make with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Well, why is that important? What house did Jesus come from? He's the lion of the tribe of Judah. So we are all young lions of the tribe of Judah. Okay? So I do that because he's talking to you. I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts and I will be their God and they shall be my people. I swear we've heard that before. No more shall every man teach his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord. For you will all know me. Jesus told us on New Year's Day, when I come in and sup with you, we will talk, we will converse. In essence, we will get to know each other. You will learn about me and I'll tell you of things to come. <laughs> From the least of them to the greatest of them, says the Lord, for I will forgive their iniquity and their sin I will remember no more. So Jesus is. Jesus is God incarnate, our reconciler, our justifier, our righteousness, our connection to life, our substitution, and the yes and amen of all that God has to offer us. And the, and, and the yes and amen, I think, for us in this point in time, very specifically for this 1147 Sunday morning, is that I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts. How is he going to do that? By talking to you. By talking to you. Jesus said that the Holy Spirit, when the Holy Spirit comes, he will take of mine and declare it to you. In the declaration is when it's written on your heart. In the declaration is when all the authority you need to do whatever he's telling you to do is transferred to you. In the declaration. When he makes the declaration to you, he is actually breathing life into you. He is empowering you to become, okay, I'm going to borrow the army's phrase to be all you can be. <laughs> I, you, are you you're an army vet? Oh, wow, I'm sur I am surrounded by army people. I am way outnumbered. You know you know when when you're outnumbered by either Marines or the army. You know what you do? Shut your mouth. <laughs> My mama didn't raise no dummy. 
<laughs> hey, but I'm a bad man when I got 4,000 of my seller friends with me. <laughs> All right. So whenever you see, let me show the next slide, please. Whenever you see the next slide, it should be, just, it should be proclaiming Jesus is, right? Whenever you see this, I want you always thinking, huh? What? Yes, proclaiming Jesus is. Whenever you see that, I want you thinking about all the things that Jesus is, particularly to you personally. Whenever you see someone who is under the oppression of the devil, I want you to be thinking about who Jesus is because you have to deliver the package to them. Without fear, without trepidation, with boldness and confidence, just like Jesus himself. Huh? Okay, I, I'll, I can add that next time. Jesus is. Our, is God incarnate, our reconciler, our justifier, our righteousness, our connection to life, our substitution, the yes and amen to all that God has for us. Well, if that doesn't ignite your fire, uh, I've heard your wood is wet. <laughs> and the only thought in my mind is, are we walking closer and closer to Christ? Are we, are we becoming manifested sons and daughters? Are we firmly rooted and grounded in the identity which never changes? That's a growing church. How do, how do you respond when what, what Jesus said, I, and if you want to get mad at somebody, get mad at Jesus. <laughs> Jesus said, trials and tribulations are going to come your way. But don't worry about it. I have overcome the world. Okay? That's not James. That's Jesus. So if you want to be mad, be mad at him. No, don't do that. Right. Okay. So, so my when I when I when I think about how is the church is how do we respond when as Mike Tyson says, Mike Tyson says everybody has a plan to get punched in the face, right? How do you respond when you get punched in the face? I, I love that. I love that response. My wife said praise, right? Is there a scriptural basis for what she just said? The Lord said, in all things, give thanks. He didn't say for everything. He did not, he did not say, Lord, thank you for this cancer. That is. No, 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 no. He said, but while you got it, praise. Why? The one thing I always say to you guys is if something happens in your life, just praise until you see the provision. And I didn't say praise until the provision shows up. I said praise till you see it. Because the provision was released for you. Yehi or be light. Your provision was released then. You just have to see it. Amen.